here is singer-songwriter, broadcaster, audio-video artist, entertainment agent and your host for the Dharmic Evolution. It's the master storyteller himself, James Kevin O'Connor. Hey, welcome back once again to the Dharmic Evolution. I am so happy today because this is the very first ever Israeli artist we've had on the Dharmic Evolution. I'm so happy we're with this wonderful pianist, artist, songwriter. This lady does it all. She hails from London right now, originally from Israel. And her music is crafted piano composition alongside soulful vocals. She describes it, it's almost as if Alanis, Tori Amos, and Florence had a baby that made a soundtrack. Classically trained opera singer and self-taught pianist, she's been making music her entire life, touring in the US, UK, Europe, and now settled in the London music scene. Her debut album, Flying Through Water, is now out and it can be streamed, purchased on Bandcamp and SoundCloud. She has extensive experience as a singer performing jazz, soul, Motown rock, and has collaborated with some jazz and swing greats like Robin Banerjee of Amy Winehouse fame, Hassam Ramsey and the Jive Aces. She delivers an epic showstopper, displaying her abilities as a captivating performer, master storyteller, and a powerful and diverse vocalist. I love another master storyteller. She recently teamed up with UK producer and writer Stuart Cooney to perform axiomatic music for film and TV. You better strap up your seatbelts, because we're taking a ride today with Callie Rivlin on the Dharmic Evolution. Callie, welcome to the Dharmic Evolution. Yay, we did it. <laughs> so, so great to have another artist from London. And... Um, I know you. I know you travel a lot, and you're you've gone through Europe and everything. And first and foremost, I want to congratulate you on the new album, "Flying Through Water." <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's not something by now, but it's definitely one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life. Is that know? right? Absolutely. So, I mean, so work of art. Yeah, I mean, it's really um, powerful. You have a, um, you know, it, the more I listen to. You, which I was delighted that um, I I went back for another listen to the whole project again, and um, you know the depth of it is just beautiful. Like you know when I see a song that's like seven or eight minutes long, I'm like, wow, this person's <laughs> brave, you know. Like and and I like that because <laughs> like what do they have to fill it up with for eight or seven minutes? Yeah, I know. Yeah, That's because uh, oftentimes we're told, no, no, you know, we, that whole radio thing got to be a three minute song and yeah, boring. All right. So, um, but you're, you, I can, I can tell you have a lot of symphonic in your blood. You know, you have a lot of powerful arrangements uh, that come through your music and it shines forth in such a way. It's really, really beautiful. Um, so how Thank did you, you um, how did you get started? Like you're classically trained. You, were you a young girl when you first right. started piano? Well, basically, I, I wish I had more classically trained background on piano. What I had was a lot of classical training on my voice. So I'm a singer and a piano composer. And I started with singing really young. I was eight. Or when I was seven, I really loved music and I was just all about it. I didn't really understand. You know, when you're a kid and you just kind of accept things, you don't really know what they are yet. You just kind of, you're drawn to certain things and you just kind of accept them. And I was really young and I asked my mom to take me to vocal coaching. And she asked around. She, she's not a musician. She didn't know. And she asked around. And then people told her to take her to the conservatory. And then I, I did. I went to music conservatory. Uh, and I started with opera. And that was, wow. you know, intense. But again, I didn't think about it. It didn't cross my mind. I just didn't know any better. I thought, is this how you learn how to sing? Cool, I'll do it. And that's what I started with. And I, I do recommend it because it's such a, you know, classical feel you so have to be immersed in it to and, and, and practice and want to do it and that is how I got started with vocals and I've been doing it ever since and the piano was a funny story it came to me by total fluke by accident uh when I was about 14 or 15 a really good friend of mine uh, she's a really good buddy she moved to the apartment building right next to me I knew their piano and it was beautiful I always thought it was stunning but I never played it and uh, she asked me, she told me that there's a few inches difference between the hallway and the thing. And it doesn't fit because there's a big piano. It doesn't fit in their house. 
And she, she asked me if I wanted it. She's like, I'll sell it to you real cheap if you want it. I don't know what made me say yes, because I had never played a piano before then. I didn't know where I was going to put it. I didn't have room for it. But I was like, yes, immediately. I just kind of went, boom. You know, it really struck a chord with me. <laughs> what a fun. <laughs> but I, uh, <laughs> Interesting but metaphor, I, right? <laughs> yeah. But I, but I just thought, you know, I have to have it. And uh, I got the piano. I got it in my room. Uh, my room was pretty small. It's, it took over the entire room. I had to, like, leave my bed in a funny way. But I just, in order to have the piano there, it was massive. And actually, my album cover, um, I'm, like, the photograph of my album cover is basically me sitting on my piano. That's the piano? That's the piano. I was going to comment on that album cover. I love it. I said, that is so Thank cool. You. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, the dress is nice. The whole thing is just really, really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. I've, I get so many comments on that, on that and particularly that dress. And I met recently the photographer that had taken this photo and I hadn't seen her in a while. And we were talking about that. And she was like, man, that was one of my favorite, you know, photos that I've, the, like the photo shoot was really that dress and the vibe and the, everything. It's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll you know, I'm, I imagine you'll put a little link there so people can see what we're talking about. It's, yeah, it's, it's yes. really good. And then my feet are kind of dangling off to touch the, that piano. Right. And, so you don't uh, play with your feet, do you? I don't. No? Okay. No. <laughs> Not yet. Can you imagine? That would have been like some kind of internet sensation. Yeah, you know, it plays would the be. piano with feet. <laughs> Maybe I should do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're going to not keep anybody in suspense any longer. So this is the title track, and this is called Flying Through Water, Kelly Rivlin.
Callie, that was amazing, amazing Thank track. You very much. Really, just I mean, I can tell you pour, poured your heart and soul into that track. And uh, you know, how did it come to you? And is there any is there any significant metaphor that flying through water relates to lyrically, or is it just you know a state of consciousness? Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about your thinking behind this? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So Flying Through Water is probably one of my favorite pieces that I've written. And a lot of the piano stuff that I write, it just sort of come to me. I don't, I'll sit at the piano. And again, because I'm not classically trained, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I, I'll sit there and something will come to me and I'll start playing it. And then I would kind of link in from different bits, different bits that I've played. And I put them together, even if they're different concepts, different keys sometimes. And I kind of melt it into one thing. And that's Flying Through Water because at that that song has a lot of different bits and a lot of different sections to it. And when I sat down to kind of compile them, they all worked together so well that I didn't feel like they were a separate piece. I felt like they were one continuous thing and I would play it and play it and play it. I'd play it for 20 minutes for whatever, like, you know, I would just, I played it forever. And I came up with this lyrical sort of vocal hook with the, uh, da, 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 da. so I, I came up with that. And I started singing it over and over in different variations. And I didn't have lyrics at that time. Then something funny happened, an interesting thing, uh, by coincidence, coincidence or fate or whatever you want to call it. I have a friend named Fraser Key Scott. He's a very um, English gentleman. He's a very, uh, he's, he's a, a British poet and an art dealer. And he's absolutely fabulous person. And I didn't know him at the time. We had mutual friends, but I didn't know him at the time. He wasn't in London. And he sent it to me. And because um, I wrote it when I was in already living in London and he sent me this email saying, oh, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends. I really love your music and some of the things you do. I would like to write a song for you. And I honestly have not I don't recall receiving any offers like that beforehand. I think it was the first person that sent me that. And this was a while back also that when I actually wrote it. So this was like going, I don't know, seven or eight years back. And so it wasn't the social media wasn't as prolific as it is today. If you know what I mean? Right. And I said, okay, let's let's try. I didn't want to let him down. You don't want to bump someone out when they're offering something and you're like, maybe I won't like it. And I said, you know, give me a, a concept for a song, give me a title, and I'll write something for you. If you don't like it, you can chuck it. I won't mind. And I said, okay. And I told him, the concept is flying through water, go. I don't know where I came up with it. I just, it literally just was the first thing that, that kind of flew to my head and I went flying through water, boom. I did not know at the time the significance it would have but I know where I know where my thinking was at. I can and, and like I analyzed my thought process was you want to achieve something that's impossible. And I say this in shows as well. When I preface this song, you want to achieve something that's a little bit impossible and flying through water does sound like something that's impossible. And that's what you set out to do in art, in life and anything. And I wanted to inspire other people to do that. And he totally got it. The lyrics of the song are basically people struggling through situations that are hard work and they feel like pinned down by it. And like they're struggling and they're dying and they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's that emotional, like very strong emotional turmoil when you're feeling like you're defeated. Everything is it's the end of the movie. Like <laughs> the, the, the battle scene is there. Thanos has won, you know, all that kind of right. <laughs> stuff. Very dramatic. Yes. It's very dramatic. And then you, you, and then the chorus is like, which the chorus takes five minutes to get to. I'm aware this is not a pop song, but right. uh, like you, the, the chorus is like, you know, you don't need to, to dive down. You can fly through the water, through the water, <laughs> you know, and um, that, it has a lot of emotional significance to me. And um, he has written the main bulk of the lyrics. I changed some things around and added some bits, but basically that's his lyrics and my piano composition. And uh, he's written another song on the album as well. And I just felt like this is probably one of the best favorite pieces of mine that I've written. Yeah, because there's every time you put it on, there's probably something new. Like I love that ascending powerful bass line that runs through it. And uh, it reminded me a little bit of there's a band in the 70s called Renaissance, which was were really, really different. And they, you know, Annie Haslam, I think it was, kind of led it, um, was the singer in that. And, uh, you know, they were they were so different that they were just like, <laughs> you know, they ran away from anything pop or anything. So they were like progressive and they were this and they were that. And and your music reminds me of of that in that it's not 
easy to pigeonhole it, which I really love because, you know, it's a little bit of everything good. And if you want, <laughs> you know, if you want your imagination you. to be, you know, to be processed and stimulated, this is the kind of music to listen to. You know, it's really, Oh my really God, beautiful. that's going to be my favorite new thing. I'll just, people will ask me, what's your music like? I'd be like, it's everything good. Yeah, everything Everything good. that's good in yeah. the world, it's that. It's babies. <laughs> and fun showers and sunshine and just it's everything good yeah it's it's so cool let's do let's do another one what do you say Callie okay. this one let's is called it. if you want blood <laughs> If you want blood, and I love the laugh at the beginning, it's like, you know, you put you put it in a good place to say, let's have some fun with this track. So if you want blood and the revolution will not be televised. Exactly. <laughs> so what does that so, reference, uh, the revolution will uh, not be televised? Um, okay, well, if I had to, first of all, that laughter thing was, I was, we were, I was laughing and then we were kind of talking about Conan O'Brien actually in the studio that day. I, do you know who he is? Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I love Conan O'Brien. He's been my favorite like TV host and one of my favorite comedians for the last 20 something years. 
And um, I was thinking about this joke that he had done and whatever. And so that, that, that's what I'm thinking about in that particular moment. And that song is actually quite dark. And that's probably why I wanted to bring some lightness into it in the beginning. The, yeah. the subject matter of the song is really dark. And that ties into the television will not be, the revolution will not be televised. I'll, I'll give you the background of it. I have been a singer for a long time and I've been offered to do a lot of TV reality shows. A lot. Like all of them. The Voice in London, The Voice in Israel, and X Factor, and American Idol, and Blah Blah. Like all the different big shows. They all have scouts and they call you and they ask you, do you want to do the thing? We'll get you special auditions. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. They're looking for people. Right. And I always say no, hell no. And then they try to convince me, they try to persuade me, and they're like, why? It's really good for you. It'll be good exposure, blah, blah. And uh, I always say, it's not going to be good for me. It's going to be good for you. You're going to get your, your product out of it. You're going to get a TV rating out of it. I'm not going to get anything out of it. Right. It's not my game to win. And also, you people are, you know, you're for the devil. And so, <laughs> because you're for I've what? Been what did you say? You, did you say? About it. You say for the devil, did you say? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So tell, is, so tell me more about that. Tell me why that you, like, what's in your heart that says, uh, because I relate to this. Like, like, nobody's calling me, trust me. But if they did, I would, I, <laughs> I, I would, I would have the same, you know, I would have the same response. Is like, listen, that's yeah. not my jam. But but you feel that there's some kind of, like, first, first is, do you feel like they're evil? And do you feel like it wouldn't do anything for your career? I feel like the intention behind it is very ominous. And let me clarify, there are some humongously talented people who go on these shows. Yeah. I don't hate the player. I don't hate the players. I hate the game. Right. I will never, like, I, I'm not saying a bad word about these contenders who are absolutely phenomenally talented people. What I feel is that the premise behind it is really obscure because you're making art every man. You're, you're bringing down the bar of art. You're, you're tearing down artists from this Olympus of inspiration. They're meant to be... Um, people are meant to be ascending to that height. They're like the certain Olympus that artists are meant to take you to. And once you bring them down and you tear them down to people, to, to, to every man Joe's level, and you photograph them and paparazzi them in the, in the you know, department store or in the bathroom or doing this or doing all these mundane things, you are ruining some of that illusion. Now, I'm not saying let's not be transparent about things. What I am saying is that art is the very highest quality of communication. That is what art signifies that is what art is that is what pure creation is and when you tear that down and you make artists very uh mundane and yeah. human in, in the worst possible sense and they're gladiators in an arena that's part of the lyrics as well it is like a modern day gladiator arena where everyone has to fight each other and they, they literally put them in a, in, in a ring you know where you have to fight each other to to win a thing and i just find it so incredibly covertly hostile I don't want to fight other people. I don't want to, you know, there's this thing sometimes other artists and other jazz artists particularly in that style where you kind of walk into a place and they're like crossing their hands and they're like, come on, show us what you got. I'm like, that's not the world I want to live in. I want, I love other artists. They're my favorite people. I yeah. want to create with them. And I feel like these shows have brought down the level of art and patience people have and everyone's a critic. Everyone's a judge now. They're like, oh, look at this. But it's not, it, it's not your, your job. It's not gonna make you happier ultimately to just sit there and judge what's going to make you happy is to be inspired by all of this wonderful art that's being created. And that's where that song came from. That's from a place of like um, frustration and, and pain and just disagreement and uh, a real sense of like, you know what, you know, th this is guys that like, this is, this is not going to fly. You know what I mean? Especially not through water. <laughs> exactly. You have a, um, extremely profound way of framing your thoughts olympus of inspiration i love that um <laughs> you know you're kind of a girl after my own heart because i i feel like um i've always felt that you know if you're blessed with artistry in your life you will do anything to protect that and you will not yeah. you'll you'll do even do like whatever kind of other jobs to to find sustenance 100%. to keep your your artistry going and intact and keep it um you keep it protected and keep it growing, you know, because it's it's this wonderful fountain of um, of spirituality almost that's inside of you. And yeah. like you said, you want to inspire people, and you want to, you know, you want to always keep that. And you know, people have said to, to me for years, "Hey, you should go on," you know, so and so. And I'm just like, 
that's just not my jam. And I'm not, I'm not being disingenuous to like you, like you said, to the to the people who go on that. Listen, I think it's great if they can carve out a career. But as far as an artist, because a lot of those people are singers, there's a right. big difference between an artist and a singer. So not all singers are artists, That's and right. you know the artistry is the the most, you know, it's the greatest gift I think you could ever have. Just because you you have that, and I was saying to someone recently on this show is like, you know, I still feel like the very first time I completed my first song. I still have that that same elation all these hundreds and you know maybe thousands of songs later. <laughs> and I know a lot of them were bad, but you can't get to the good ones unless you write the bad ones, but you still have yeah. that same feeling. So my my if I had a hat, I, it would be off to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So tell me about um when you had this epiphany, or maybe it wasn't an epiphany, maybe maybe it grew slowly inside of your spirit to say, you you formed a very strong opinion about this and about your music. When was that? Is it something that came on throughout your life, or was it something that just you know happened to you one day? Because I so admire that you are able to. You're like the only one who's saying, "No, I'm not com- coming on the Voice or whatever," you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's other people. I've had this conversation many times, and what what's funny about that? I've told you about the aspect of like people and scouts from these TV shows are calling me or coming to see my shows or whatever. I did an Amy Winehouse tribute show with Amy's original guitarist, um, Robin, who's a friend of mine. In you know, a couple of years back in in Israel, and this girl literally from in fact, she'd come and she, she sat there throughout this tour. She tried to get hold of me and like see in this. And it was a it was a pretty big thing, and it was some of it was televised and the whole thing. And I was like, I am not coming on your show. Like, I am, honey, no, this is not happening. And the the funny thing about that is that people from the the audience, a lot of shows that I do, or people that hear me perform or wh- whatever, they come up to me like, you should go on the voice. They're trying to help. They're being, you know, they're being super nice and gentle about it. And I get so so many of these different communities. And I always appreciate it. And I say to them, I have, you know, I'll say, I say, that's very kind or whatever. And then if they ask me more about it, I'll say, you know, uh, I have an answer to diffuse that of between five to 45 minutes. It's like, it depends on how much time you've got. And then I'll give them my whole spiel about why I think that that is. I think I've always known that. I've always had an aversion to it because even like reality TV is an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. You stick a camera in a person's face and you try and watch them have a normal interaction inside a house or inside a thing. Like, you know, it started with like uh, MTV, the real world and survival and all these different things, what, maybe 15 years ago. And it's passed off as reality TV. That's not reality. These shows are scripted. I know some of my friends have gone on them. They're very scripted. They're very manipulated. They're very, they're selling television. Yeah. That singing show or competition could have been, it, it could have been all you know um a a tv show about uh kitchens or about computers or about travel it's the same thing they don't care about that they care about ratings and the human emotion and everyone's crying so i i have a real aversion to things that are disingenuous and not authentic i i can't stomach it i can't i cringe it's kind of oh and so those shows i always feel like they're putting down the art And instead of setting a bar high enough so people could aspire to it, which is one of the biggest concepts that my producer who's worked with me on this album has taught me, you kind of set the bar, the common denominator so low that people are like, oh, they'll respond to it. They start, you know, really getting there. And I think, um, yeah, that, that's how I see it. And and with my music, I never made an intentional decision to like, oh, I'm gonna un like uncommercialize it in order f- to be a certain way. I just, you know, kind of did what I loved and learned from a lot of people like Tori Amos and Jeff Buckley and Chris Cornell are some of my favorite, favorite, favorite artists. And their song structures, if you study them, are just wildly unpredictable and, and stunning it all works together it's not like noise you know what i mean it's not some out there experimental music it still sounds like a coherent piece from start to finish and i strive to you know emulate that and um do it in the best way that, that i can and that's sort of like the linear line between me and that that's what comes out of me do you know what i mean well, yes, I do. And that was one of the deciding factors for me that I reached out to you when I saw your 
post on Facebook doing some kind of tribute to Chris Cornell, and then I'm checking oh, out right. your music, and I'm going, wait a minute, this girl, because I'm a guitar player, and it's like, you know, you know I'm like, I, I really love the work that Chris Cornell did, and I said, I, I got to find out what's going on with this lady. And then I heard your music, <laughs> and I said, I said, you're really deep. You've got, you know, the fact that you appreciate the artists that you just described and that you're creating the music that you create was like wow this is a real music fan and and just to follow up what you were talking about i i totally agree with you in the fact that we've somehow managed to um devalue the currency of our music in such a, a way that it's, exactly it's very disturbing to me because i see people going, you know, I spent a lot of time in Nashville and, and a lot of these people go up and they play in these bars who, who, are, who are very talented. And you've got like, just everybody is so focused on drinking, conversation and the TVs that surround the entire place. So I, yeah. I feel like I'm sort of on a mission to, to ferret out places that people want to come and really listen to music. And so bars are kind of like, you know, I, I did that in my past and I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to um, developing my audience, if you will. And I, I get the feeling that you kind of do the same yeah. thing. It's like, you know, how can people appreciate what you're doing if you're in a noisy bar and everybody's yelling and screaming? And it's like sad, I mean, it's a different, you know? different type of show. It's a different type of atmosphere. And I sometimes have to do those shows too. It's like, as you said, you do whatever it takes to get your music going. Yes, but I have yes. to tell you, particularly that Chris Cornell night, it was a magical night. A friend of mine, uh, Magdi, he set it up. It was it was stunning. It was magical because you were surrounded by people who are music fans and love the same music that you do. Yeah. It was even between the songs, all the music was only Chris Cornell from all different periods, all different bands. Uh, there was projections on the wall of his stuff. Like people really genuinely, who genuinely just, you couldn't miss how um, the love and admiration for this guy and the, his creation and inspiration was in the air. It was something unique, and, and then you, when you're surrounded by that and people who genuinely just really love the music, and it's not for any other reason, no one was getting paid, it was all for their charity, for Vicky and Chris Cornell's charity, it was amazing. That's fantastic. You know what? I think we got to play my track, and it's not my track, it's Callie's track. Here we go. Left shoe, right shoe, our shoes But I wanna tell you I wanna tell you That you mean to me That you mean to me and The story of our orbiting And the story of our orbiting In the closet, waiting the moment patiently. Left shoe, right shoe, our shoes. But I wanna tell you, I wanna tell you that you need to me, that you need to me.
hanging in the closet So long, 12 years I wanna tell you, I wanna tell you oh, You surround my universe My son, my universe, my child So it sounded like, um, yeah, the violins in the beginning, really, really gorgeous. So why my track, Callie? Okay. Well, um, first of all, the violins, thank you for commenting on that. That was one of my favorite bits on the album because um, to get to see like your music embodied by other people, do you know what I mean? When you see a string quartet playing your stuff, it's just very moving. And I was in LA at the time. I was doing some gigs in LA. And they, my producer was in Israel finishing this album and recording them. And we were on a Skype meeting. And I was like, very much like we are now. I was looking at this computer and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God. Like, I was so excited. I sent my sister over there to be my representative while this whole thing was happening. And it was just so wildly enchanting. And it really kind of inspired me also to want to put my music in film and to make it like to see it on big orchestration and yeah, which will happen. And right. uh, it's, it's a big goal. Um, but what inspired my track was actually my sister's wedding. So I have an older sister um, and she got married like, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago or something, a long time ago. And when for her wedding, I wrote the song and it literally just poured out of me in five minutes, five minutes flat. I had the whole song, the, the chorus and the verse, everything. It was so fast. And that doesn't happen to me very fast that, that way normally because normally I get the music down first and then the lyrics, I kind of think about it and da, da, da. And this, this time it really came completely differently. And the pe person who wrote the strings for this particular track also after the song had already existed and was in a different way was my producer. So I have to give him some credit. His name is Barak Olio and he's an Israeli guy. He's amazing. Um, but so Say his name the, again. Say his name again. Barak Oliel. Barak Oliel. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> um, it's on. It's on the album credits. Okay. But um. But he like he really made it something unique. He totally understood my vision, where I'm going with it, and that's an advice that I would give to other people as well. You need to work with people who get what you're doing, will do their best to improve it, but not take away from its original meaning or its original concept. Um. So to answer your question regarding my track, I just feel like we all have a, a time track that we're on. Do you know what I mean? From yeah. the time we were born and the, you know, until we die. And man, like when you find someone to go with you on your track, on your track record to follow you through life and, and be married, uh, cause I was writing the song for their wedding. That's really beautiful. That's something exciting. And, and, um, it's a big deal. It's like, it's, it's, it's a flatmate for life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and someone to follow you on your path. And I just, that's why I call it my track. It's fabulous. I, I love the the concept behind that. Um, growing, you. you did you you grew up in Israel? Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yes. So so where do you make home now? Do you make home in London or are you? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, I do. So I've how is the how was the transition for you to to go from Israel to London? <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, I traveled around a lot, so I spent some time in LA and New York and in. Uh, in, you know Copenhagen and in London and the UK but I always knew that um, London and the UK was my favorite place you know I love Scotland I love 
London and England. And it was always, it felt like home to me, you know, from the first moment I set off, you know, I set my foot here. I was just kind of like, this is, this is the thing. And um, I kind of been having this love affair with London for the last seven or eight years. I went to the music uh, college here and uh, spent a few years here. Then I went back and all the sort of thing. But um, London has something very special in it, which is people are thirsty for new music and they're quite open and willing to listen to it a lot of times. Of course, it's a an artist who's new and you're trying to break it through the new thing it is hard but people are a lot more patient i found and they would be in other places including the u.s where people are like okay like wh what um market revenue sales stream can i put you in they, they do try and pigeonhole you a lot more yeah. and in the uk i feel that like there's a lot more freedom in a sense that you can just like oh what are you making great i'll listen to that you know people are yeah. open to it right. and uh, the transition in terms of culture it's such a big melting pot here and, and London particularly is incredibly diverse. There's people from all over. It's not just British people, it's people from all over the world, which is fabulous. And they, so other than the fact that they value music and they go out to see music all the time, people of all ages, they're all in the pub, they're all going to see music. Part of the reason why they're in the pub is that they're drinking. They drink a lot. I don't drink. And I have this conversation a lot. I get into this conversation a lot. People are like, why don't you drink? Because people are like, oh, can I get a drink? Oh, like it's, a, it's such a big part of the culture. Right. And it's almost offensive. So I'm like, you don't drink. <laughs> and I have to, you know, explain myself quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I never wanted to. It's not like, oh, good for you. Like, well done that you're like restraining yourself from this thing that you obviously right. want to do. You're and just I'm not like, interested. I don't. I've never wanted to do it. Yeah. I've never been interested ever. Right. And then I grew up and learned all the damages behind it and seen all the kind of after effects as well. And I'm like, no, thanks. It's not, yeah. not appealing to me. So that's a big cultural difference. Um, I love seeing how everyone goes out to see music though. That's a massive, massive part. Right. Yeah. When I, um, when I first started the Dharmic evolution three years ago, um, I didn't want to be just in the States, you know, just to underscore your point about like making it, you know, because music is, is it's in it, it's just an international language with no barriers, oh, yeah. you know, and I felt yeah. London was kind of a gateway to the rest <laughs> of the world, you know, it really like people go to London and then they go to Dubai and they go to South Africa, wherever they go, but it seemed to be, so I got a lot of artists from, from London to come on the show and it kind of opened the door to like all these other places in the world. Um, so to that end, I'm very thankful that um, I found you from Israel in London. And, <laughs> and I'm so happy to have, like, I think you're, you're the first Israeli artist I've had on the show. So Ooh. I'm really happy about that too. So this is like a double blessing for me today. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and and I just you know I really love uh, what you're doing like with your music. I just I love the um, the adventurous soul that you have, and you know the um, you know just damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Not since we're since we're in London, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know just like you don't really take prisoners. It's like listen, my music is my music, and and I know where it belongs, and I think that's special. And I think you're going to influence a lot of people from this broadcast to uh, to do the same thing. You know, it's just a wonderful Thank thing. Thank you. Yeah. So, and I will stress out that it's it's hard sometimes. You know, like you you do have to find yourself like making this music or fighting for it, not knowing if it's going to be successful, not knowing if anyone's going to listen to it, not knowing if you're going to get a placement. But you still have to do it. You have to make it. It's your baby. You know. Yeah. It's you know it's. You know, part of that, that's all part of being an artist, like a true artist, when you can do that. Um, but I think the rewards are, there are people who have like maybe more monetary success, but can't do, and you know, I know that a lot of them get to where like, am I really still doing this? And I, you know, I feel yeah. like, you know, I'm being pressured to do this and I don't want to write yeah. these kind of songs. So I think, you know, following your heart like that is, is just wonderful to, to continue to do this. So I want to ask you about the once and future king because i love the title of this Ooh. thing so should we, so we should should we talk about it before or after the track why don't you give me a little uh set this up a little bit callie for everybody this one this one is good to set up actually it's funny okay. that you should ask beforehand because uh <laughs> this is one of the first songs that i've ever written and it's probably one of my favorites uh, i don't know to tell you how i came up with it i don't know it just sort of came to me and i started playing it and it was there it was just all the way that it is now I've been playing it as it is. I mean, it's, all, it's always slightly different, but basically the basic structure of it for like a good 
12, 13, 14 years now. This song has, you know, had a lot of track record before it went on record and been recorded. And I wrote it as part of like, you know, this might be real to some people and maybe some people are just gonna be like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But for me, the concept of spirituality is very alive and the concept of knowing certain things or remembering certain things that you don't remember ever learning. You know what I mean? Like there are certain things that I certainly felt or knew as a kid and very deep thoughts that I felt like I couldn't speak to other kids that don't relate to that. They were interested in very shallow, very whatever things. And I always felt like a very grown up person inside a little body. And certainly while writing this song, I felt like people have such a rich track record and there's certain things that you just feel like you've been in a battle before and fighting your, your guts out for something that really matters to you. And for me, it's all about like, that memory of knowing something and having certainty in something that you know like i've been here before i've felt this i know what this is you know and that track record of like if you were great before you know like if you were some king or some emperor or some person of influence and you were important you can and will strive and and return to your throne to your appropriate place right awesome i i love that and so everybody Strap up your seatbelts, because here we go <laughs> with the Once and Future King. Thank you. 
notes at the end yes thank you so beautiful song what is your piano of preference i love the tone you're getting um what is my piano what of preference like what what do you play oh it's... my piano of preference i always love playing a real piano first of all start yeah. with that i'll take a real piano even if it's a little honky donkey one over keyboards anytime any day yeah that's uh you know if i have um Steinway are amazing. If I have a Steinway, that'd be the best. The ultimate penultimate is a Bosendorfer. They're the best pianos in the world. What they is it called? Bosendorfer. Okay. German made? So it's a German company. Okay. And yeah. And uh, they are, the I think, the oldest piano company in the business. So they've the got world. it down by now, right? They... Oh, they're the best. <laughs> they're, they're like, a Bosendorfer is, it will cost you more than a house. Like, I've played a Bosendorfer a few times and I've always been in awe of it. I don't have one. I wish I did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, that one is amazing. Steinway Sons are amazing. Steinberg are pretty good. Yamaha are fantastic. You know, that's my preference would always be towards, in my dream of dreams, like a, a grand piano that is a real piano. Wow, where do you um, where do you do your recordings? Do you do them in London or do you do them just wherever? Like I do some in London and some wherever. The particular album was recorded in Israel. We had a beautiful studio. It's called Pluto Pluto Studios in Israel. So um, a big chunk of it was recorded there, and a big chunk of it was recorded at my producer's studio, um, which, which again was in Israel. And um, and he had you know a great piano and like everything was live. It was all live instruments you know, string quartet and the guitars and the different like tapping in, uh, instruments and um, certainly the piano. And it was very important to me that it's a live analog sounding record. And recently I've kind of gone more into, um, you know, slightly more electronic stuff with um, production and just things like that, because I've, uh, I think I've told you about this a little bit, right? The, I have a producing partner in London yes. that I started a company with. Um, it's uh, it's a project called Axiomatic Music, mm -hmm. and the um, reason we called it that is because we just figured, okay, well, it's an axiom. Axiom is something that's like that's the law of nature. That's it's just how it is, and it works, and it's you can't argue with it. It's infallible. And then we figured we're axiomatic music, which is very arrogant, but <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like it would work. And it's music for it's film and TV, basically. Yeah to score them and that's what i want to do like we we love that and that's that's where my heart is at to, to really kind of you know people told me specifically with the once and future king that they feel a lot of images coming up of like you know as if someone's in an old battlefield or um you know struggling through something like overcoming this like oh it's like a spiritual experience it's not like a, a, a you know a song that you dance to or like a background thing and so I wanted to take that and, and move it to the next level. Yeah, basically. I don't think it's arrogant. I think it's really just awesome that you're doing that. Um, you know, it's just Thanks. another another place where your music can shine and be appreciated, you know, especially, you know, I, I could hear it like, you know, movies. Your, your soundtracks all over movies is just such a natural fit, you know. It just, I, I think so, yeah. yeah. And I didn't, you know, I, I knew that that was a strong aspect of it when I was making the album. But while I was writing the songs, it didn't really occur to me. I just was sort of naturally writing what I wanted. And I, I was, I really wanted to tell a story with the music. 
and that's what it is. Yeah. So what yeah. is what is your um, big plan for the rest of 2019? Are you gonna um, be, <laughs> are you gonna be touring like playing locally in London? Are you gonna be touring? Are you gonna be writing well, again, or all of the above? Like what's the all of the above, all of the above, and just like playing and ev anywhere and everywhere uh, that the, I possibly uh, can uh, book myself. I want to get on some festivals this year because I haven't actually done that very much, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm quite a princess. I'm not ashamed to admit, but of like, uh, you know, I need, uh, I'm, I'm a girl who needs my like bathroom and my makeup and my everything. And so I've not gone camping and gone on to like crazy festivals, which in the UK right. is such a cultural thing. People go all the time to festivals here. Yeah. And they go, yeah, you know, you bring out your tent, you bring out a whole bunch of bottle of booze and all your friends and you just right. like tough it out. And I'm just like, nope, not doing any of that. So unless I'm performing in a festival, I'm not going to be in one. Yeah. And right. so. <laughs> I want to do that and I, I really want to promote like and continue to, to, to with our writing project of axiomatic music and make as many, you know, film scores or TV stuff as I can and build like a track record with that. That's my big, big long term goal to, to score film. Yeah. So as we're winding down this this interview went way way too fast but uh for me oh. <laughs> um, but um we you know so maybe we can do a round two at some point but i would like to um sure. ask you to please let everybody know out there where can people easily find you and support you like what's the best platform i mean i'll have all of your social links and everything your website in the in the sure. show notes of course but like where where should they contact you or reach out and support you easiest way is on my website so my website is calliRivlin.com. okay it's just my name just like it sounds so calliRivlin.com. it has all of my yeah just like it sounds exactly like it sounds and, and it's, it's uh, easy to find me there and like i've got a band camp link there to my album and if you can buy it or stream it there if you want to support um or just listen to it and i've got you know some upcoming shows on there i've got a way to reach me i got all my socials and everything excellent i i really uh really so enjoyed this and i you know i enjoyed meeting you and getting to know all about your music and you know i just want to wish you all the um all the luck and success with uh not only axiom but your own personal career and i know it's <laughs> going to find a lot of light cali rivlin thank you so much i've enjoyed this really like tremendously thank you for caring about music and i can tell that it's a mission for you you know then i really whenever i see that i'm like oh he's a comrade so thank you i appreciate it thanks james flying through water if you want blood my track the once and future king we covered a lot of ground today with callie rivlin from israel now in london Please support her music. All the links are in the show notes for you to support everything Cali. We talked about opera, vocal coaching at the Music Conservatory, and everything good. And I did find a Bosen, what is it? A Bosendorfer? Piano on eBay used for $99,000. I'm thinking about it. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not. As a guitar player, I have enough trouble with that, those six strings. I don't need any more. Hey, go over to the uh, Facebook community page, Dharmic Evolution Facebook community page. You got to go there and post your content there because more and more people are coming on the site, um, you know, sharing content, putting up your videos, your new songs, your new album, a photo shoot. Maybe you're playing a gig somewhere. Let us know what you are doing or do you want to just support another artist on there? That's what we put it up for. And if you're an author, speaker, thought leader, you can put your content on there too. A new book, a speaking engagement, whatever you have going on. That's what we do here at the Dharmic Evolution. Hey, please subscribe, rate, and review this show in iTunes. Or you can go through our website, dharmicevolution.com, and subscribe. Make sure you're on our email list so we can let you know what is happening. What is happening? I wrote a depression manual. Is there somebody in your life that you love who suffers from depression? It's on all my Facebook pages. It's a free download. It's just a little toolbox that you can download. Put it in your phone. If somebody's struggling, they can go right to this and they can get helped out. That's a wrap for me today. Just want to thank everybody for the support. 
I'm your host for the Dharmic Evolution, James Kevin O'Connor, singer, songwriter, audio video artist, master storyteller, and international talent agent. So until the next time, when we meet again, I'll either see you on the socials, or I'll see you from a stage.